gladdening the mind. This is an important skill in the meditation. Because when the meditation starts getting dry, it begins to seize up like an engine that doesn't have any lubricant. So you need to keep your mind lubricated. Keep it refreshed as you're practicing. There are lots of different ways of doing this. John Lee gives an, the analogy of a parent who hears a child crying and knows when to take it out for some air, when to give it something to play with, when to feed it. In other words, you learn to read the cry and to look at what the child is doing, and you can get an idea of what needs to be done to put the child back in a good mood. The mind is very much like a child. It needs to have its moods looked after every now and then. One way is dropping the breath for a while and focusing on some of the other recollections that the Buddha recommends. Recollection of the Buddha, recollection of the Dharma, recollection of the Sangha. Reminding yourself that you're following the path set up by someone who was totally free of defilement had no agendas, had no ideas. He was pushing over just for the sake of satisfying himself or pleasing himself. He would found what worked, and he taught that straightforwardly. And where are you going to find something like that out? elsewhere in the world. And one of the reasons why deconstruction is so prevalent in, in the universities is because they begin to see that so many times when people advance an idea it's because they're trying to get power over other people or influence other people to act in ways that are pleasing to them. But in the Buddha's case, all he asked was that people practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. At the night of his death, when devas were throwing down flowers and singing songs and throwing down incense, he said, this is not the way to pay homage to the Buddha. The way to pay homage is to practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. Which means practicing for the sake of dispassion, practicing for the sake of disenchantment with things, practicing for release. In other words, you show homage to the Buddha by gaining release from suffering for yourself. That's all he asked for. The most compassionate of motives. So when you're getting discouraged about your path, well, think about the other paths you might be following in life. You realize there's nothing quite like, quite like this one. And being on this path, even when you're not to the end of the path, it's a good path to be on. The same goes true for recollection of the Dharma. Think of all the good things the Dharma has you develop inside. Of course, being on the path means that they're not fully developed yet, but at least you're headed in the right direction. Your trajectory is headed to the right place. The Buddha, talks about, the Buddha talks about the, the grief that comes from not having attained your goal in the path, but he says, look, that's a lot better than the grief that comes from not having sights or sounds or smells or tastes or tactile sensations that you're like. He calls that householder grief. Now, where does that grief lead? It lead, leads to people that are struggling and fighting and grabbing after things that are just going to slip through their fingers. Of course, the grief that comes from being on the path is something you can deal with, and it leads in the right direction. It should inspire you to practice further on the path. It's just when the grief gets a little bit too heavy and the discouragement gets too heavy, that's when you need to gladden the mind by reflecting on all the good things you've done as part of the path. And the path is asking you to do only good things, things you can be proud of.
things that feel noble, honorable. You're not being asked to compromise your ideals when you practice the Dharma. In fact, you're being asked to raise your ideals to a higher standard. In this recollection of the Sangha, when your mind feels full of defilement, remind yourself that members of the Noble Sangha have all been in the same place you've been in, that you are in. People of all kinds, men, women, children, rich people, poor people, educated, uneducated, healthy, sick. They've all been able to find within themselves the, the strengths needed to come over, overcome the weaknesses that they're encountering in the path. And if it seems like you're having a long, dry stretch in your path, you can read some of the Terry and Taragatas, where they talk about long periods of dry stretches in their own practice. So you can take encouragement from that. And this recollection of your generosity, recollection of your virtue, all the good things you've done as you've been following the path. This is a valid recollection, a good one for gladdening the mind as well. Then there's one called Recollection of the Devas. This doesn't mean you sit thinking about Devas, you think about the qualities that make a person into a Deva. A sense of shame when you think about doing things that are beneath you, realizing that you're a better person than that. Fear of the consequences of unskillful actions. Which means that you have a well-integrated sense of self, when you're a person who's able to deny yourself immediate pleasure that's going to have long-term bad consequences for the sake of actions that they may not be so pleasant right now, but they're going to lead to good results on in the future. There's a story in the canon of a monk who's sitting in the forest and happens to be a, a holiday. And off in the, the city in the distance he can hear people playing music and having a good time, and he feels very discouraged. Here he is sitting out miserable alone in the forest, and everybody else is having a good time. And a deva comes to him and says, look, there are lots of people who really envy you because they see where you're headed. The people out there having a good time, their lives are not headed anywhere. So when the path starts getting discouraging and the mind starts feeling dry, these are things you can think about to remind yourself that you're on a good path. It may be a long path, but it's a lot better than not being on a path at all, or being on a path that requires all kinds of compromises in terms of your ideals, in terms of your sense of what's right and honorable. Then there's the breath. You can use the breath to gladden the mind as well. We talked about this a little this afternoon. Finding ways that you can breathe that give a sense of ease, sense of well-being, a sense of refreshment both to the body and the mind here in the present moment. Don't be afraid of don't be afraid of those feelings, thinking that they're an attachment. Of course you're going to be attached to them, but it's better to be attached to good things than to be attached to things that stir up the mind in the wrong direction. And in the beginning, these feelings of refreshment, feelings of rapture sometimes, they come and go without any seeming pattern. But over time you begin to realize that they do have a pattern. When you get more and more familiar with them, you can tap into them more and more regularly. Another way of gladdening the mind with the breath is to explore 
different ways of breathing. Try to think of a way of breathing you never thought of before and see what it does for the sense of the body. Think of the breath energy coming in, not from the outside, but welling up from within. Or breathing with different parts of the body, breathing with your legs, breathing with your arms, breathing with your fingers. Noticing some part of the body that's kind of the neglected stepsister. It doesn't get much breath energy, and focus on giving it as much breath energy and as much attention as you can. In other words, use your imagination. If you feel patterns of tension in the body, think of a big knife coming through and cut, 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 cut all the patterns of tension. In other words, use your imagination here not to wander away from the present moment, but to explore some of the possibilities in the present moment. Try to think of some impossible ways of breathing and then try them. Because you can learn a lot about your body that way, what's really possible and what's really impossible. It's like reading about quantum physics, some of the ways that are required to explain what they've noticed in their experiments, so to believe that certain particles go backwards in time. That required a real leap of the imagination. There's so much out there in the world that's counterintuitive. Your sense of the body here in the present moment has a lot of counterintuitive potentials as well. But if you only go with your normal intuition, that's all you see, is what you expect to see. See if you can surprise yourself with new ways of thinking about the breath. So there are lots of different ways of gladdening the mind. And as John Lee said, it's like a good parent. You need to have lots of different tricks up your sleeve. If the child cries and all you do is feed it every time it cries, you're going to be missing a lot. Because sometimes the child has to go to the bathroom. Sometimes it's just bored. Sometimes it needs some fresh air. It needs a change of scenery. And then if all else fails, nothing in the meditation seems to cheer you up, go out and just walk around for a while. Find a little job to do. Notice some place where it's not clean in the monastery, or things are disorganized, and straighten them out. In other words, learn how to find pleasure in doing skillful things of, of every kind. And John Fuhrman talks about how when he was a, a young monk, he used to avoid con construction projects around the monastery. He'd help a little bit and then sneak off and meditate. And John Lee never said anything until they were preparing for the Buddhist year 2500. And then John Lee was going to hold a big celebration at the monastery. And one day he said to a John Fuhrman, he said, if you don't help me, I'm going to die. So John Fuhrman thought about it for a while, and he said, well, construction work is a form of skillful activity, construction work in the monastery. He says, if I die with a hammer and saw in my hands, well, that's, at least I was using the hammer and saw for good things. So be the sort of person who's always hunting for something skillful to do. Because this lifetime we have is so short. And if you spend your time just being depressed or discouraged, you waste so many opportunities for doing good. There's so much good that needs to be done in the world. Starting from little things like keeping your surroundings clean and neat, and working on up. It's all worthwhile. And there's so many ways you can gladden the mind. There's that story in one of John Lee's talks about a, 
a woman, an older woman who went to the monastery, noticed that the walk meditation paths weren't well swept, and so she swept them. Set out some water for washing feet, and just that much made her feel cheerful. And it so happened that on her way home she had a heart attack and died, and it became a deva. Just from the cheerfulness that came from keeping the place around her clean. And the story illustrates an important principle, that whatever you can do to glad the mind in a wholesome and a skillful way is part of your repertoire as a good meditator.